اللهم صل على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد اللهم افتح علينا بحكمتك وانصر علينا برحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصل لهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل الكرام ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم Brothers and sisters, friends, all the good people that have gathered here tonight, inshallah, I'd like to talk about give and take for God's sake. One of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al Mu'ati, the giver. Another is Al Wahhab, the bestower. We humankind are recipients of divine grace. The Quran reminds us of the bounties of your Lord we bestow freely on all, these as well as those, meaning people who are in obedience and pe people who are in disobedience. This rever verse refers to the gifts of God that are given freely to the righteous and to transgressors. We are then reminded that this preference of some over others in the world will be replicated to a lesser or a greater degree in the next world. Look how we have preferred some over others. And in the next life is greater degrees of difference and more exalted preferences. The Quran also reminds us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is self-committed to grace, to mercy, that God is self-committed to grace towards His creation. Our Lord is a giving Lord, one committed to showering His servants, the good and the bad, the acceptors and the rejectors, the believers and the skeptics with divine grace. For those who believe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds them immediately in the Quran, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بالغيب. Those who believe in the unseen وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ And from what we have given them, they give out. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, reminded us كُلُّكُمْ عِيَالُ اللَّهِ وَخَيْرُكُمْ أَنْفَعُكُمْ لِعِيَالِهِ That all of you are the dependents of Allah and the best of you are the best and most beneficial to Allah's dependents. And Iyal is also a name for children. It is those who are dependent, in complete dependence to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the nature of a believer. He gives or she gives out a sense of gratitude for what they have been given. They desire to give back to Allah through the service of Allah's creation, what he has been blessed with in his life. This can be financial, intellectual, spiritual, or even simply a cheerful disposition. For surely, al-ibtisama fi wajhi akhika sadaqa, that just a smile in the face of your brother or sister is charity. And so this is our nature. The Quran also says, as for those who give liberally and act prudently with their Lord and assert the truth of there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He will facilitate for them. He will make their way easy. As for those who withhold, وَمَنْ بَخِلَ وَاسْتَغْنَ وَكَذَّبَ بِالْحُسْنَ The one who withholds, who denies, who deems himself independent of Allah and denies that truth that there is no God but Allah, they shall find great difficulty. Worldlings and other worldly people are described here. Worldlings cling to their stuff and they deem themselves independent of Allah and the needs of others. Other worldly people conversely know they're dependent on Allah and dependent upon the means by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided. They know they are receiving constantly and in order to maintain the ebb and flow of giving and receiving, they must respond to the needs of others knowing that Allah is responding to their needs. Ibn Atayla refers to a certain class of people in his hikam when he says, "Ishtihaduka fi ma dumina lak, wa taqsiruka fi ma qurib mink, 
دليل على انطماس البصيرة منك that you're struggling and striving in those things that Allah has guaranteed for you to the neglect of those things that Allah has demanded of you are clear signs of an inner vision that has been put out that you have lost inner sight the Quran warns us of being like those who when it is said to them spend of the bounties of Allah that he has provided they say should we feed those who had Allah willed he would have fed them you are in nothing but manifest error if we objectively examine the past it's clear that this ummah this community of the prophet has been one of the greatest contributors to human civilization if not the greatest and I would contend that it is the greatest when we look at the Muslims and their present condition now and we think about the question that Bernard Lewis has posed to this community Bernard Lewis wrote a book called what went wrong but what I would like to say to Bernard Lewis is the Muslims can ask the same question of the Western Hemisphere what went wrong we now on this planet are living in two completely dysfunctional hemispheres the northern and the southern the vast majority of wealth in the north is accumulated from two major industries the armaments industry and the industry of drugs of intoxicants these are the two primary money-making industries in the northern hemisphere armaments and drugs weapons of destruction and weapons of distraction so we can sincerely ask Bernard Lewis to explain to us what went wrong in the West but instead of doing that our job in essence as Muslims is to answer Bernard Lewis what went wrong many things have gone wrong in the Muslim Ummah and we must recognize that if we're to move on and we in the United States have a unique historical position our unique historical position is that we are neither of the East nor of the West we are people living in a space that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described as the space of the strangers al ghuraba people who neither feel they are of this or of that because we are seeking to live a life committed to a spiritual path to your Lord is your end in the midst of a cornucopia of nihilistic materialism we are struggling to maintain our soul we are not the only ones there are many people in this society that are having the same struggle and we have to recognize that we have to recognize that there are people here that are having the same struggles as the Muslims and they are in increasingly larger numbers this is a country that suffers from depression in epidemic numbers this is a country the children of which are now increasingly being put on Ritalin and other drugs in order to deal with the psychosocial problems that are manifesting in the schools this is a country in which people are reaching such levels of difficulty and stress that we have people when they're fired from their jobs they go and they shoot their co-workers because of the despair these things are happening in increasing uh, proportion in this society and unfortunately we can see many of the same social ills that have manifested in this country that are manifesting in the Muslim world the Muslim world has its own unique problems many of them are actually alien to this culture we suffer in the Muslim world unfortunately from levels of, of unethical business practices of gross state corruption of corruption in our politicians in the people that have been given what the Quran terms the people that have been given the responsibility of the affairs of other people and we have to recognize that those societies now that are in these dysfunctional and moribund states do not necessarily have to be the conditions of the Muslims living in the West particularly those 
who have thrown off those shackles amongst the immigrant communities who have entered into the workforces in this society and are as efficient or more efficient, as ethical or more ethical than many of their co-workers. But it certainly should not and never should be the fate of those who have grown up in this society that do not have the baggage of other places. And our young people are an immense source of inspiration. If we look at the young people from our community, they are an immense source of inspiration. If we look at the Muslim world, Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, said in the late 19th century that Europe holds the Muslim world in contempt, but it is a world that in its golden age made even our 19th century look very late indeed. He recognized a certain quality in Muslims. He said that they are a chivalrous people that do not have a slave mentality. They do not have resentment. The disease of resentment is a deep-seated disease that the Arabs call al-hiqad. And it's something when it possesses the heart, it can lead to the most heinous actions. Because people that are filled with resentment, when they find the object or their perceived object of suffering, they will often do what they can to attack and lash out at that perceived object. I can honestly say that my experience in the Muslim world at looking at the Muslim world, the Muslim world that I look at is the Muslim world of the millet system of Turkey, of Ottoman Turkey, when Christians and Jews and Muslims live with dignity and respect. When, when Jews living in Ottoman Turkey actually invited the Jews of Europe, saying, come and flourish in the lands of Islam. When we look at what those who went before us left behind, we have to bow our heads in humility at their architecture, at their art, the fact that their domestic utensils are now sold to the highest bidders in some of the most expensive auctions in the Western Hemisphere. The very bowls that Muslims ate from are now seen as extraordinary works of art. This is only the outward state, because the outward is only an expression of the inward. If the inward is beautiful, then beauty must manifest. Every vessel from what it contains. In the, in, in the Muslim community in this country, we have very serious questions that we have to ask. One of the questions that we have to ask is why is it that so many Muslims have learned the worst of the Western civilization and failed to learn the best? Why is it that Arab television now competes with MTV? That now naked Arab women dance on television broadcasted from the capitals of the Muslim countries today that compete with the worst and most degraded aspects of this culture? Why is it that in a film that was done on 9-11, that was done by 11 directors from all around the world, the only director that had a gratuitous sexual situation in the 11-minute vignette was an Arab coming from the Arab world? Why is it that we've learned the worst of this culture? We have not learned how to stand in lines. We have not learned how to prefer other people when we get on the buses. We have not learned those basic civilizing forces that were so common in the Muslim world and what we affectionately call adab or courtesy. And our Prophet wasallam said, Adabani Rabbi my Lord has made me courteous and what an excellent courtesy he's given me. And the Quran reminds us, You are on a vast ethical nature. This is the nature of our Prophet. And like the poet Ashoki said, Civilizations are nothing other than their ethical nature. And when their ethics goes, the civilization goes with it. So we have to ask that. There are people that visit foreign countries and all they learn is the foul words of the language of that country. That is what they bring back from their visit.
in the Muslim world now, we don't see, we see Muslims dressing like Western people. We see them now increasingly eating like Western people. We see them driving the cars of Western people. We see them increasingly be entertained by like Western people. And yet we don't see the same commitment to the standards of excellence that exist in the workplace, that exist in the, uh, in the, even in the government conditions. We don't see any of these things. Unfortunately, the West has mastered form. But what the West so deeply lacks is content. The, the West has mastered form. And this is something that we as Muslims have to learn, but that form needs to be infused with the truth of what we know to be true, the principles that we live with. The Muslims are religion, follow a religion that's infused with celestial aspirations. We are celestial people. We are people of the stars. By the stars they are guided. The Prophet said about Salman al Farisi, if knowledge was on in the constellation of Pleiades, there would have been people from this man's people who reached that knowledge. This was the aspiration that he was indicating, and this is a miracle of the Prophet ﷺ because the Persians became some of the greatest scientists, some of the greatest scholars of Quran and Hadith. All of the great mathematicians that came from Persia, all of the muhaddithun, except for one amongst the, the great muhaddithun came from Persia. We have to recognize that those who have migrated to this country have learned to function at some of the highest levels. Your skills have made you the envy of the workplace. Muslims are in the highest positions in managerial and in executive positions, and some of them own their own very successful businesses. We have become the doctors of this country. In Time magazine last week on the blackout, the doctor that was in the picture was Dr. Tanweer, a Pakistani physician probably in New York City. He was the one that was in the hospital treating the man. When David Letterman can say on national television, I went to my physician and he said, turn to Mecca and cough, and people laugh, you know that people now have Muslim physicians in increasingly larger numbers. There are over 20,000 Muslim healthcare workers. And, and if you're willing to put your life in the hands of a Muslim doctor, and you think that Muslims are terrorists and desire harm for you, then you're a fool. It's as simple as that. But the people actually know that some of the most excellent doctors in this country are doctors from Pakistan and from some of, and India and the Arab countries, Persia, some of the finest physicians. Really, this is something that we should be very proud of, but we should also ask ourselves an important question. How is it that a religion that has less than two million followers, and that is the sect of the Seventh-day Adventists, who are a Christian group, how is it that they have three teaching hospitals? And we as Muslims in this society have yet to produce one major Muslim hospital. Why is that? And I challenge the physicians in this room, I challenge you to, to do this. And there's Muslims that, that unfortunately will say, you can't work with Muslims. And that's simply not true. That is from the devil. That is from the devil. Not only can we work with Muslims, we must work with Muslims. And we have to set aside our petty differences so that we can work with Muslims. This Muslim community is young, vibrant, and filled with a potential and a core of people that can literally change the landscape of this society. We're the inheritors of a struggle in this country to keep this country in course with its founding principles. We are the inheritors of that struggle. Most of the people that preceded us suffered much more than we have ever suffered as a community. They suffered loss of life, including the Hispanic peoples, the Chinese peoples, the Mexican people. 
the Native American people, the African American peoples, the Japanese Americans, they have all suffered greatly. And their suffering enabled so many of us to come into this country and be treated with respect, being treated with equality because people put their lives on the line. And we're not only celebrating the 40th anniversary of ISNA, we are celebrating the 40th anniversary of the March on Washington of Dr. Martin Luther King. And I do not believe that those two dates are fortuitous. I believe that there is a connection between these two great events because we are now in the position in this country to challenge once again the very thing that Dr. King challenged this country in Washington, D.C., to ask the question, are you willing to live up to the truths of your formative declarations that all people are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Are you willing to live up to the words of Thomas Jefferson when he said that freedom of religion is an essential right in this country and it is equal to the Christian, to the Jew, to the Mohammedan? And he mentioned the Mohammedan because that is providence, that is the hand of providence that moved his hand to put the Mohammedan in that great text of the Virginia Act of Religious Freedom because Muslims are part and parcel of the tapestry of this country. We have been here from the beginning and we're here to stay. And this is a message. And we have to be willing to sacrifice and to struggle just as those who went before us sacrificed and struggled to improve this society. We can change this society. And if you don't believe it, you're not recognizing your historical purpose. The people in this auditorium can change the fabric of this society. By and large, and I want to really emphasize this point, we must stop personifying America. America is not a person. If you, this is called in logic the fallacy of personification. When we say America is our enemy, when we say down with America, are we saying down with Rachel Corey, who put her life on the line in Palestine? Are we saying down with a 63-year-old woman from Florida who went to Iraq to act as a human shield? Are we saying down with America when we're speaking about my 83-year-old mother who marched in San Francisco in a march that was entitled Not in Our Name? There are millions of people in this country that are deeply disappointed with the actions and the misguided policies of our government in the Middle East and in other regions of the world. And we have not only a right, not only a right to speak against those policies, we have a responsibility and a duty before God and before our fellow Muslims and our fellow human beings in other parts of the country that are suffering because of those misguided policies. Both Abraham Lincoln and Senator Clay both proved during the Mexican War that not only was dissent against the policies of a president during a time of war a constitutional right, it was a moral obligation. And to call people who speak against the misguided policies of this country anti-American is essentially anti-American. It can be nothing other than Stalinist because that is the nature of those who want to squelch dissent and call people of dissent anti-American. We are not anti-American. We are adhering to the finest principles of this country. And if we don't recognize those principles and recognize that they are Islamic principles and stand by them, then we have failed to live up to the historical task of this community. And that is the truth. And the truth is sometimes bitter, but our Prophet, may, may Allah's blessings and peace be upon him, said, قُلْ الْحَقْ وَلَوْ مُرَّةِ Speak the truth, even if it's bitter. Speak the truth, even if it's bitter. We must speak the truth. This is our right and our obligation. I want to say that we have to reject the fallacy of personification. We can no longer speak of us versus them because we are us and we are them. We cannot speak of us versus them. It's unacceptable.
when we talk about the Crusaders, are the Crusaders one out of every 50 English people that sat, and I was there, that stood in the cold, the freezing cold of Hyde Park, over a million people standing for five hours to say not in our name, representing 80% of the English population. Those are not crusaders. Those are people of moral conscience, and we applaud them and congratulate them for standing up for what is right, and we stand with them. And our Prophet ﷺ said that I was called to an alliance in Jahiliya in the pre-Islamic days, if I was called to it today in Islam, in other words, by non-Muslims, I would answer the call. And this is a clear directive, a clear mandate from our Lord and from the Messenger of our Lord that not only can we stand by them, but we must stand by them. We must stand by those people who are standing by the very same principles that we hold dear, because they are our natural allies and we are their natural allies and we must in solidarity stand with them. I want to say that we cannot spin our religion. Our religion is not amenable to spin. And by spin I mean that we cannot change our rhetoric because now the media is watching. We have to change because of principle. We have to recognize that we have made mistakes in the past. And the sign of the people of God are those who repent from their mistakes and who change. This is the sign of people of growth. It is the people of stagnation that are fixed in some rigid inability, sclerotic state that does not enable them to change. We as biological creatures must adapt to, the, to those things outside of us that are affecting us. This is the nature of life. If you do not respond, you are dead. And we must respond. So we cannot be people who are not principled people. Our God is the God of humanity. Our God is the God who said, Rabbin nas, Marikin nas, Ilahin nas. That is our God. Our God is not the God of a tribe. I did not come into Islam to join a tribe. I came into Islam to be with the truth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, be witnesses unto God, walaw ala anfusikum, even if it is against yourself. When we see the conditions in Iraq, we have to reject the tyrant of Iraq as much as we reject the misguided policies of those who remove the tyrant in Iraq. They are both wrong. And our Prophet sallallahu does not stand on the side of asabiyyah. And when he was asked, what is Asabiyah? He said, Man da'a ila al-Asabiyah falaysa minna. Whoever calls to Asabiyah, to some type of provincialism, of tribalism, is not from amongst us. And we can add to that nationalism. And they said, what is Asabiyah? And he said, Antu'ina akhaka ala dhum. That you help your brother in his oppression. We have to recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes tyrants. He breaks the backs of tyrants. This is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He will do it with non-Muslims just as He will do it with Muslims. He will break the backs of tyrants because we believe that ultimately it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that permits what is happening in the world. And if we lose sight of that, we will lose sight of our tawheed. We will lose sight of the fact that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is in charge in this world and we are living in a moral universe. We are living in a moral universe created by a God of morality, created by a God of right and wrong, commanding us to right and prohibiting for us wrong. If we don't enjoin what is right and prohibit what is wrong, we are not of the people of khayriya. Kuntum khayra ummah ukhrijat linnas. You are the best community that has been brought forth. You call to what is true. You believe in Allah and you enjoin what is right and forbid what is evil. That is our historic mission, to do it in ourselves, to do it in our communities, to do it in our homes, and to do it at the level of our nations. There is no longer the despotic condition of al-hakam wal-mahkum as they had in the traditional books of fiqh where the ruler ruled and the one who was ruled was simply a passive object. 
No, in this country, we have the ability to affect change, but we have to be active. I want to remind you that Western people, like all people, are paradoxical people. They are people of good and they are people of wrong. Every people has these qualities. The best of people are those who their good outweighs their bad. There is immense good in these societies and we have to recognize the good. But there is also immense wrongs and we need to recognize those to call people's attention and to struggle against them. I want to remind all of you we have a great lesson to learn from those noble British people that ended the slavery movement. They were British people. Although England was one of the greatest recipients of money, financial gain from slavery, it was also from England that the anti-slavery movement began. And you should study that movement to understand how effective change can take place because it was done by the middle class. It was done by simple people. It was done by people that petitioned, that wrote pamphlets, that went and spoke the truth, that lobbied their politicians in the House of Commons and in the House of Lords until in 1836 they finally abolished slavery in England. And that is a testimony to people like the man who wrote Amazing Grace who was a slave trader. And he repented to his Lord and became an abolitionist or somebody like Hannah Moore, an aristocrat who gave up her wealth in order to struggle for the freedom of the slaves. We have people like that in this country who are not from the Muslim tradition. We have to recognize those people, work with them. We need to abolish armament. The Muslim world is filled with weapons of mass destruction because England, France, and this country have armed them to the teeth, have squandered the wealth of those countries, have taken the wealth of the children, have taken the wealth of the educational institutions, and why is it that Arabia is the seventh largest purchaser of arms on this in this planet? That is wrong. And these people need to be taken to account. Armaments is a great evil. And our Prophet ﷺ said, whoever sells weapons in a time of civil strife is damned to hell. That the one who sells weapons in a time of civil strife is damned to hell. And this is really where the struggle is. It's stopping the proliferation of weapons, it's stopping the proliferation of drugs, and it's condemning racism, it's condemning the fact that in Rwanda, 800,000 human beings could be massacred in our lifetime, and the world stood by and watched it happen. And then everybody sheds tears for a few white people that die. We have to recognize that every life on this planet is sacred, and God has given it a sanctity, and it's our duty to stand up and do something about this. And I will end this by saying one thing. I reject President Bush's statement, you're either with us or you're against us, as much as I reject Osama bin Laden's statement, you're either with us or you're against us. We cannot turn this world into an insane dichotomy of those who support state terrorism and those who support vigilante terrorism. All terrorism is wrong, and bombing civilian populations is inflicting terror on those people. And I shake for the children's hearts that were petrified as the bombs dropped on Baghdad. And I feel ashamed that I'm in this country when things like that can happen in our lifetime. And we reject it. We reject it. And we will speak the truth. And we are Americans. And we are Muslims.